So in this video, right, Neil De Beer is actually blasting President Ramaphosa's new seventh administration cabinet for comprising of multiple ministers who have been charged with graft or corruption or different questionable past charges and have been actually still sworn in to govern the people of South Africa. Let's listen to how Neil De Beer explains the cabinet and breaks down actually the cabinet of the seventh administration in South Africa. And I'll be back for some really interesting analysis from Herman Shaba's action essay and also the Daily Maverick actually unfolding and opening up who's who in terms of who's actually guilty of past charges or having questionable past within the cabinet of South Africa's seventh administration. This, the problem that you've got is too many chefs. I mean, this is a cliche. We have a combined minister and deputy minister portfolio grouping of 75 people. You know what is astonishing is 32 ministers. 43 deputy ministers. We, we now see major parties in the GNU, the GNU, whom actually made one of their policy voting platform discussions the size of the cabinet. The mere statement that they said that we are going to a half cabinet, in a cut cabinet, and now they sit there Part of that bloated cabinet is absolutely, to me, ridiculous and, and hypocritical. The other problem is, I don't know if you know it, but after analysing this cabinet, is it also not shocking to know that out of these 75 ministers, that 41 of them have been charged? And out of the 41 that actually faced charges, criminally, that of that 41, 12 of them are still on ongoing cases. So not only do you have this colourful, rainbow colour, rainbow size of a cabinet, but some of them are charged on being criminal. So that's the one thing that makes me frown. I mean, you just saw the absolute hip hypocritical manner in which the ANC continually speaks about renewal, about change, about threatening corruption. Zizi Kordwa falls on his own sword, gets wasted by his own batard, goes to court and gets charged, and then walks into Parliament the next week merrily and takes an oath of office to uphold the Constitution. Just that one person. That's ridiculous. So no, this is not a good news story on, on many of these people who are sitting in that bloated chair. But what is more the problem, Chris, is that we've rehashed some of the old, where we had an opportunity to now cut out the dying roots, and we just brought them back. So there are certain of these ministries that I'd like to focus on and tell you what is the critical 100-day forwarding, and some of them that are just utter ridiculous. Please go ahead. I mean, let's start with the pinnacle. You know, Chris, I always look at safety security cluster first. We have Angie Mujeha that's moved from a dismal failing basic education ministry where we got the so-called 30%. That was an absolute disaster, no matter how she wants to paint a zebra. And she moves over now to the Minister of Defence. Now, when she was asked, what kind of knowledge and expertise does she have in defence? Her statement was that she doesn't need to have it because she's not going to go fight in the bush. She's not a soldier. Now, that statement on its own sends shivers down my spine because if she did that to 30% basic education, is she going to say that she's only going to get a 30% hit rate on protecting this country? So, so that is the naiveness of the debate where I told you before, I would prefer, not in all, but on the critical algorithm points of this country, defense, police, health, education, infrastructure, and finance, there we go, that we get people in that position, because that, that is what I call the critical backbone of a nation. So here we go, we take a minister of education that failed, she failed. And you take that person to defense, which currently is a failure. Brilliant. What do you guys think? Um, I think it's really 
it's really difficult how to assess this situation. Um, the whole thing with having pasts, you know, and haunting past, especially as politicians, is actually really something that is almost, I could say, inescapable because we all come from a place of youth and youth has multiple exuberances. You see like uh, Renard Lookhouse um, and how, uh, you know, the recent video that was actually uploaded, uh, you know, really almost um, cancelled him as a political, um, you know, uh, as a politician in South Africa. And all these other guys as well, Julius Malema, Floyd Shivambu of EFF, Jacob Zuma, everyone, all of them have skeletons in their closets. There are issues in their past, which, you know, probably could be digged up. And actually, Neil De Bear has actually in a previous video argued that this is one of the ways in which the government of national unity might collapse because it seems that, you know, all of these guys who have multiple skeletons in their closets might be subjected to different forms of betrayals or um, uh, scapegoating in that regard where whenever one tries to push a policy that might probably benefit the multitude of South Africans, uh, he might be threatened by a certain kind of skeleton or a certain issue in the past that might stifle um, their positivity or move forward to uh, push through policies that would actually lead to the greater satisfaction and, and excellence for the greater South African. So that's that's something that's the, that's the reason why it's really tricky and really important that you know, cabinets are actually made up of people who probably have, uh, you know, in a way, um, appreciable past or less negligible uh, charges as corruption or graft, which can actually always be pulled up by both the electorates and those members, other members in the cabinet, to either stifle or propagate a certain form of agenda uh, within the parliament of, of, of African nations, you see. But for this video anyway, I found two really interesting articles that I thought that we could analyze what Neil De Bear argues through here. Three of them actually from AP News, from Action Essay, and also from, um, you know, uh, the Daily Maverick explaining the kind of corruption that's actually embedded, uh, you know, within the government of national unity cabinet and those people who encapsulate these corruption charges. So it argues that, you know, uh, one particular name that comes to mind a lot, many people have seen many uh, comments, is Ko or Zizi Kodwa, all right? It argues that a South African cabinet minister, who is a senior member of the African National Congress, was arrested and appeared in court on Wednesday over allegations of bribery, just as his party was meeting for talks to work out a way forward for the country after the election deadlock. And Zizi Kodwa here was actually the former sports, arts and culture minister. I don't know if that's the position uh, that has actually now been given to Gayton McKenzie of the Patriotic Alliance. But it says that Zizi Kodwa faces charges of taking bribes of around $90,000 actually. Um, and he appeared in a courtroom in Johannesburg alongside other suspects in the case. It says that Zizi Kodwa said that he intended to plead guilty, uh, to plead not guilty to these charges and that he resigned as minister after the court's appearance, but he denied the allegations according to the statement from the ministry. 54 um, years old, Zizi Kodwa is a member of the ANC's interim internal national working committee, which met on Tuesday as the party discussed how to form a government, all right? And after losing, uh, you know, its 30-year majority, the ANC, as Zizi Kodwa was actually member of the Internal National Working Committee. Anyway, it says that the ANC has not given any indication of which other party or parties it might strike an agreement with to co-govern. We know that actually so. But anyway, in terms of Zizi Kodwa, it argues that Kodwa was implicated in taking bribes from a businessman at a judicial inquiry in 2021 that looked into the allegations of widespread government corruption, including ANC officials and others. And it says that these allegations relate to the time when Kodwa was the national spokesperson for the ANC and later the Deputy Minister of State Security. Anyway, Herman Mashaba's action, con action um, essay actually blasts uh, this um, Zizi Kodwa for, you know, being reinstated into the parliament once more in this seventh administration uh, by President Cyril Ramaphosa. So the Report on action I say actually says that it condemns the corruption accused Zizi Kodwa's reported return to parliament as ANC MP. It says that action I say condemns the shameful return of disgraced former minister Zizi Kodwa, who is reportedly set to be sworn in 
uh, you know, as an ANC member of parliament, despite facing serious corruption charges for, for allegedly accepting a 1.7 million rand bribe, all right? It says that charged with violating the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act, the former minister finds himself in a dock at the Palm Ridge Specialized Commercial Crime Court, facing charges stemming from evidence in the State of Capture report, which accuses the former minister of accepting a bribe in exchange for influencing the awarding of government contracts. It says, consequently, it is unthinkable that in any nation governed by the rule of law, that an individual can simultaneously juggle courtroom appearances for breaking corruption laws while sitting in parliament and shaping the country's laws. Now, uh, action essay says that as we await with bated breath the announcement of President Cyril Ramaphosa's cabinet, it is evident that yet another new era promised in his inauguration speech is off to a rocky start, noting not just this matter, but all also the fact that the very MC of his inauguration, namely Nomvula Mokonyane, is herself implicated in the same state of capture report for corruption. Fundamentally, Action SA believes, it says that Action SA, now Action, Action SA is actually believe that a corruption-free and prosperous South Africa is incompatible with the AMC, and any attempt to to sell the half-baked renewal of the ANC by diluting their patronage through a so-called government of national unity is an affront to the intelligence of uh, South Africa. So that's um, the position from Emma Mashaba in Action SA, actually saying that, you know, it's really shameful that President Ramaphosa will still in, in, install this former MP despite the fact that he's had these really disgraceful uh, corruption charges uh, placed on, on him. That's a ZZ Cold War. But anyway, the Daily Maverick goes a lot deeper, you know, with um, this picturesque view of all the MPs in, in the seventh administration's cabinet that actually have skeletons in their cupboard, what it calls uh, the multiple MPs with a checkered past in the house of the dishonorable. So um, it argues that, you know, the opening of the seventh parliament, you know, uh, which took place on July the 18th, uh, President Ramaphosa confirmed that 58 MPs from Jacob Zuma's and Konto Wessis were sworn in, uh, and that that means that the 400 nation strong National Assembly is now complete, and it features quite a number of parliamentarians with what he, what they, what um, it's called checkered pasts. It says that it is not permissible for an individual to become a member of the National Assembly if they have previously been convicted of a crime offence and sentenced to more than 12 months imprisonment without the option of a fine. So this, this is a kind of like a law in South Africa, right, that it is not, in, it is not permissible for an individual to become a member of the National Assembly if they have been previously convicted of a criminal offence and sentenced to more than 12 months imprisonment without the option of a fine. And I think this was one of the major reasons why Jacob Zuma couldn't return to parliament because he actually met most of these uh, criteria. So it says that this is um, from section 47 of the constitution of South Africa. And it says that the prohibition falls away if more than five years have elapsed since the sentence was completed, okay? So um, if an individual uh, is convicted of a criminal offense and is sentenced to more than 12 years of imprisonment without the option of a fine, that individual, according to section 47 of South Africa's constitution, is not permitted to be a member of the National Assembly. And that this clause can actually elapse or, be, or fall away only after five years have elapsed since the sentence was completed, all right? So that's how critical it is to be uh, like kind of like really clean prior to becoming or striving to become a politician or an MP as a member of parliament in South Africa. So it goes on to say that it was this constitutional clause, like I said earlier, that prevented Jacob Zuma from leading his new party in parliament. This is why um, John Schloppen now will now be leading the opposition from the MK party in the parliament in this seventh administration. Um, it argues that, you know, um, parliament has its own code of conduct with which MPs are expected to comply after taking their oath of office. But it says that this only applies after they have been sworn in. 
It now argues that it is for this reason that Parliament could not take any action against the newly sworn in DA MP Renato House in the wake of racist videos he made some years ago resurfacing because the videos were posted prior to his becoming a member of the house so the reason why Renato house will still remain a minister and mp in the parliament is because of the fact that this video resurfaced after he had been sworn in all right it says that in the wake of racist video he made years surfacing uh, the videos were posted prior to his becoming a member of the house so this is the reason why parliament could not take really concrete action against um Renato house now, it also says that the DA has since suspended Renaud House pending an investigation. And also, um, you know, it argues that the party's DA's insiders, according to the Daily Maverick, has actually raised concerns about the Renaud House's offensive online behavior on multiple locations. But they had, they had actually fallen on, on deaf ears among members of the DA leadership who appeared surprised by his online following. Uh, so anyway, it says that Helen Zille, DA's federal chair, had actually previously said that the DA's MPs, MP candidates undergo a grueling vetting process with 11 steps in total, ranging from taking an exam and going through an interview process to public speaking tests. Now, with, re with regards to Renato Gauss's fitness for an MP, it argues that, you know, the party director of communications, uh, you know, actually noted that he is speaking now saying that they do not have a strict process of vetting people, but that he thinks that it may be done, that uh, he says that he thinks this may be one that got away. All right. And that the DA's new parliamentary cohort, which also includes Bongin Kozi Madikizela, who was actually sworn in as MP for the first time, first time earlier this month, um, Madikizela was the party's Western Cape leader until um, April 2021. And Daily Madrid actually exposed the fact that he lied actually about his qualifications, claiming a Bachelor's of Communication, uh, a BCom anyway, in human resource management that he did not possess. Okay, so that's a problem. Uh, one of the, this DA leader now, Bongin Kosi Madikizela, you know, he was sworn in as an MP in this seventh administration. And he was actually uh, previously the Western Cape's leader, uh, the party's uh, DA's Western Cape leader until April 2021. But then uh, the Daily Maverick is exposing the fact that he actually lied that he had a bachelor's or a BCom in human resource management, which he did not possess. And this is now a uh, member of the parliament. So Helen Zille actually told Daily Maverick at this time that Madikizela's fraudulent action had escaped detection because when he joined the DA leadership, the verification of qualifications was not a routine matter as it is today. And so Madikizela has actually uh, escaped that. But anyway, it argues that all four of South Africa's biggest political parties based on voter share um, have sworn in caucuses that include questionable characters, arguing that particular concerns have actually been raised about the late swearing in of former sports, arts and culture minister, the same CC Kodwa, which action I say Herman Mashaba has actually blasted in my last uh, review. And he's actually saying that CC Kodwa was sworn in um, uh, Late swearing in of former sports minister Sisi Kodwa less than a month after he was arrested and appeared in court on charges of having unlawfully received benefits amounting to more than 1.6 million rand from a businessman called Jehan Maki. So Kodwa said that Kodwa now telling journalists, he actually told journalists on, on Tuesday that the reason he was not sworn in with other MPs on the 14th of June was simply that he had family matters to deal with. So he wasn't sworn in on that particular day when everyone would have seen those who were sworn in by us representing the ANC. But his swearing was late and from his own explanation, he had issues with his family and that's why he wasn't able to be sworn in on that day, June 14th. But then he was actually sworn in late, which many have raised eyebrows on. Now, it argues that also complicated the matter, however, the ANC step-aside rule, which resulted in Kodwa resigning as sports minister after his arrest, all right? But at the time, ANC spokesperson told, uh, you know, the uh, city press that it's in line with the step-aside rule, which makes it clear that when criminally charged, a member must step aside. Kodwa's subsequent swearing in as MP has now caused a mini firestorm for the ANC and its internal factions. It argues that while some say that it is evidence of the ANC's inconsistent application of the step aside rule, um, uh, Kosatu Partner and also ANC Veterans League 
you know, both expressed dismay at Sisi Kodwa's return to the National Assembly. Even as Secretary General Fikile Balula cleared in a leaked letter that said that Kodwa was permitted to serve as an MP, but not to hold any senior leadership position in the executive or in the ANC parliamentarian caucus. He says that Kodwa's case now is particularly significant because he has actually been arrested and there are several other figures in the new ANC cabinet who have not yet been formally charged with wrongdoing but have been plausibly implicated and they are now making their return to the National Assembly after a brief period in the wilderness which in reality normally means sheltered employment at ANC headquarters at Lituli House. They include, now these guys now include, according to the Daily Maverick, it says that it includes former minister Malusi Gigiba, who was implicated at the Zondo Commission for allegedly conspiring with Zuma and the Gupta family during his time at the helm of several different departments. It says that the picture that emerged from the state capture inquiry indeed was one of Gigaba as the Gupta's and Zuma's most versatile and pliable member of the executive. Possibly most damning also is Gigaba's related testimony heard by the commission came from his ex-wife Norma, who testified that Gigaba would allegedly come home with sacks of cash from the Guptas. Really, really, really appalling. It also goes on to say that joining Gigib Gigaba on the ANC benches is former communications minister Faith Mutambi, who was revealed in, in the Gupta leaks, reporting, reporting to have passed on confidential cabinet information to the Gupta family. The organization's undoing, um, the organization undoing tax abuse uh, outer subsequently called for her to face treason charges, but Mutambi was also found by a 2017 parliamentary inquiry into the SABC uh, to have inferred politically in the running of the public broadcaster. Also on the AMC MP squad is formerly the former Deputy Defence Minister Tabang Makwethla, who was revealed by the Zondo Commission to have accepted Bosasa security upgrades worth more than 300000 at his private home. George Raymond Zondo recommended that Makwetla should be investigated for breaching the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act, which is shot in for PRECA, describing his lack of recognition that a conflict of interest would arise as scary. All right. So now zoning now to the EFF and the MK, which now have members who add a lot of more um, scoundrels, scoundrels in the house. It says that the EFF and MK hold a combined 97 seats in the 7th parliament and they are expected to work closely together. Now their seats alone are not sufficient to win parliamentary votes, but they are enough to cause significant disruption. Although EFF leader Julius Malema has already claimed that his party's days of disruption are over. Remember in his speech on the day of uh, the swearing in, he argued that he will not fight with any of the bouncers anymore in the parliament. Anyway, MK Chief Whip Jean Schloppe has actually said that the, you know, the party's MPs do not intend to also be hooligans. But anyway, as an illustrative of the ideological symbiosis between the two parties, EFF MP Busisiwe Makwebane, he says that he's argued to, he's, he's married to the new MK MP David Skosana. Mkwebane is argued by the D Daily Maverick now is a disgraced former public protector who was stripped of her post by parliament after conspiring with Jacob Zuma to try to bring down the South Africa, Af the South African Reserve Bank, among other things. Skosana, he says that here by the Daily Maverick, is a former communication director for Super Sports United, who is well known for vitriolic social media attacks on journalists and judges. Now, adding to the Red Berets' contribution to this, um, you know, number of people who have uh, questionable past in the parliament, it says that EFF Secretary General Marshal Blamini was found guilty of assaulting after hitting a police constable in the face and breaking his glasses following the 2019 sauna in parliament. It says that Blamini was handed an 18-month prison sentence and suspended for five years as well as a fine of 6,000 rand or three months in prison for malicious damage 
to property. And accusations of wrongdoing against EFF leaders in the National Assembly are legion, ranging from Malema's frequent trips to the Equality Court and his continuing trial for discharging a rifle in public, you know, not which is not yet protocolated anyway. But anyway, um, it also says that there's also the argument of Floyd Chibambus and the, the case of Floyd Chibambus' allegations on looting the VBS uh, Mutual Bank. It also goes on to say that, you know, um, corruption allegations are, are against Malema also date back to 2012 when a report by the public protector, Tuli Madoncella, uh, kind of like went into um, his on point engineering enterprise, which was found that a crime had actually been committed uh, with regards to his contracts from Limpopo Roads. It also says that MK's party choice chief whip uh, for their 58 MPs. Um, kind of like that schlopper now is actually also one of the only two judges to lose their jobs in the democratic South Africa after more than a decade of allegations of his political meddling in judicial matters. He says that the impeached former judge has actually referred to South Africa's constitution as legal and as shit stem in need of complete overhaul. Yet in being sworn in as MP, he has now taken an oath to uphold the constitution of all South African laws. He says that Schlopper's caucus includes the De Van Ruyen, the finance minister who was appointed by Jacob Zuma, seemingly on the basis that he would do the Gupta's bidding on 10th of December 2015 and recall three days later after financial markets recoiled in alarm. Um, then also there's the case of uh, this um, MP from the MK party, Andile Tama, who represented the party in the National Assembly for just under a year uh, between May 2024, May 2014 and April 2015. It says that um, Andile was expelled from the EFF after falling out with Malema and Shibambu. And it says that the Gupta leaks email, the Gupta leaks emails revealed that Andile asked the Guptas for money and at one point received instructions from London public relations firm Bell Potinga. Andile also made headlines after being involved in the illegal occupation of a double-story uh, building in Pretoria Mansion in 2018. He says that another MK, this is really serious now, and uh, uh, it's really, really, really um, unfortunate anyway how much of these parliamentarians have these cases that are actually all in public, you see, and for every, available for everyone to read, and, and they will be the ones leading uh, South Africans. He says that another MK MP to escape criminal prosecution is the day, is the Jacob Zuma's daughter, Duduzile Zama Sambudla. She was accused of having stoked violence through online posts leading up and during the July 2021 riots, which left more than 350 people killed. It says that Zuma Sambudla has neither acknowledged nor apologized for her um, actions in, 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 this, in, in this regard. But anyway, this, that's kind of like uh, the number of parliamentarians who have actually had had different charges against them and that the fact that they will be sworn in into the parliament is something that actually near the bear is raising alarm too that you know um it's it's really unfortunate that south africa had to probably go through this go down this lane as having these mps being the ones to lead the the crop of really intelligent um, south africans in that regard in that it's uh, probably i don't know if it was unable to find other mps but these are the ones south africans are stuck with they range from from, um, MPs from the DA who actually forged certificates and claimed to have certificates they didn't have to um, ANC MPs who have actually been earlier charged with corruption and graft and other forms of, um, you know, vices to the EFF and MK MPs who actually have been, um, you know, charged with for case, different cases of looting, violence and and different forms of corruption. And so this will be um, the embodiment that would make up this seventh parliament in South Africa. And um, it's quite, um, I don't know, it's really difficult to describe, to, to find a word to describe how it feels. But anyway, um, this is where, this is what South Africa would actually have to be stuck with. And as we keep on studying for the next four or five years, you see how this government of national unity would either, you know, improve the lives of South Africans or further sabotage it. But anyway, what do you guys think about this Neo DPS speech or the analysis of the people, the members of parliament who have had checkered past according to the Daily Maverick? Share your thoughts in the comments.